Quantum Science of Psychedelics, Chapter 8, The Fall of the Serpent and the Rise of the Ego, um, which is a very long chapter, so it's likely I'll split this into two parts, but we'll see how it goes. The continued rise and fall of civilizations. Following the original quantum shift to the sixth wave in 3115 BCE, the sixth world would progress so that with every new peak it would generate more marked expressions of this phenomena it had generated initially. This is an exact parallel to what we saw earlier with the waves of biological evolution, except that now it is the mind of humans that evolve. The sixth wave has a frequency 20 times higher than the fifth, and a full wave movement, one peak and one valley, has a duration of 788.6 years, which is a period that determines the overall rhythm of the rise and fall of human civilizations. <laughs> The developments in mathematics are just one example of how we can also track specific phenomena associated with the civilization through these peaks. In figure 8.1, mathematics goes from the initial use of numerals in the first day to the development of several advanced forms shortly after the beginning of the seventh day in 1617 CE. These are not randomly occurring novelties, but rather the result of a common wave-like process affecting the minds of people all over the planet. Through this wave movement, we get a hint of why Mesoamerican people saw the plumed serpent as a, as a bringer of the calendar and civilization. The evolution of human mental capabilities and the ensuing advances of civilization is not being a linear or cyclical process, but a wave-like one, and the development of calendars depends on the evolution of the mind. Hence, the emergence of civilization and its various aspects was not a one-time event happening in 3115 BCE. Instead, the first day of the sixth wave meant the first step in a global process that has continued into our own time. In this book, I do not give detailed information concerning how these waves manifest, which I have covered in other books, but it should also be clear that the steps forward in mathematics, as just one of many examples, have been favored by the days, especially clear is the explosion of the new theories during the scientific revolution in Europe at the beginning of the seventh day, 1617 CE. The most relevant example of the movement of the feathered serpent is that the various major kingdoms and empires themselves, for some reasons that will become clear in the next chapter, I have in this diagram limited myself to major civilizations in the European and Mediterranean region. The diagram illustrates how the rise of major empires conforms almost perfectly to the beginnings of the peaks of this wave, beginning with the first monarchy in Egypt. It should, however, be recognized that in the first half of the wave, the dates are uncertain, which limits our ability to explore how well the historical ups and downs match the sixth wave. The time of the so-called Bronze Age collapse has, for instance, among the Hittites, Hits, 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 Hits been set to 1200 BCE in Babylon to 1000 BCE. In the Mycia, Mycenae, Mycia, Mencia, to 1000 BC. While a new book has been set, has set it in the New Kingdom of Egypt to 1177 BCE, these are arguably all reasonably close to the beginning of the Third Night in 1444 BCE. But the argument suffers from the uncertainty in the dating of some of these events. Regardless, the night of the Sixth Wave brought what has been referred to as the Greek Dark Ages. However, when we do have certainty about dates, such as in the second half of the wave, we have a near perfect alignment to the rise and fall of civilizations. Naturally, sometimes the time when an empire rose or fell is not sharply defined. Did the West Roman Empire fall and the Dark Ages begin when the Alaric sacked Rome in 410 CE? when Attila became the ruler of the Huns in 434 CE, or when the last West Roman Emperor Julius, Julius Nepo, Nep, Nepos died in 480 CE. Did the buildup of the British Empire begin with the creation of the East India Company in 1600 CE, the unification of the crowns in 1603 CE, or when the first lasting land-based colony was established in Massachusetts in 1620 CE? In the big picture, these are, however, minor details that should not prevent us from seeing how the rise and fall of major empires in Europe and the Near East follow the sixth wave. The fall and serpent of the rise wave. Check that out. Boom.
the ups and downs of the wave in the West, in the Americas, not showing, may conform to the sixth wave in an even more startling way than what is shown in figure 8.2. And not surprisingly, it was the Mesoamerican cultures that explicitly described the feathered serpent as the bringer of civilization. The Aztecs and the Maya associated the sixth wave of Catacuatl and Cuclacan, respectively, which was perceived as a deity of light, which, as it went away, resulted in the fall of a civilization. Overall, the sixth wave displays a step-by-step -step progressive forward movement, or evolution, when you compare its different peaks. For example, it goes from a few essentially local civilizations in the first day to a global civilization in the seventh day. Since the influence of the sixth wave stepwise over time becomes greater at the expense of the fifth wave, history goes through different phases reflecting the shift away from the spiritual unity state of an under unstructured mind. In the first half of the sixth world, people in the Near East thus believed in theranthropes, hybrids of men and animals. Oh, theranthropes, like lycanthropes, but theran, therian, as in, you know, terra. Many animals. <laughs> Hybrid men of animals, legendary heroes, cosmic serpents, shamanic practices, giants, prophets, and so forth, while in the second half, after 550 BCE, with a more rigid mental structure, these phenomena were, placed, were replaced by religions, often with a single god, or at least over time, an increase focused on the individual. What this tells us is that the state of consciousness that provide these different kinds of experiences are initially linked to the shifts that these quantum waves go through over time. When we see patterns such as the one in figure 8.1 and 8.2, it is reasonable to ask why they exist in the first place. Why does human creativity, as well as civilizations we create, go up and down according to such a clear wave-like pattern? The answer is that the eight partition geometry, which through its effects on our minds, created the various aspects of civilization, follows the wave. It is activated in the days, peaks and deactivated in the nights, valleys, creativity, with the development of civilizations depends on is a function of its dualist geometry, which is present in the heart of the sky and is something that fluctuates. How is the wave movement this cosmic serpent created? Mathematically speaking, a sine wave movement such as the sixth wave would be expected to generate to be generated by a rational movement of some kind. The movement would be related to a yin-yang duality in the place of creation, which would go in and out of this wave movement. We may not know exactly how this works, but we can be certain that these movements are related to the Axis Monday. It is clear that the ancients were aware of this enigma and expressed the generation of the wave movement in a symbolic churning of a pole by the math, by the mythological pair to, to represent. I'm gonna get to that in a second. I gotta show you guys this. There's a right there too. pair to represent the yin and yang of the universe. In many cultures, twins symbolize yin and yang of duality. In figure 8.3, we can see how some ancient cultures envisioned how the rational, rotational movements creating these ups and downs of civilization were generated. In the Hindu representation, the ropes used for churning was the serpent king, the Suki. In general, ancient peoples, I love, I love Hindu mythology. Hindu mythology is kind of the most fun is they honor it as mythology. They just have so many different gods. They have over 100,000 different gods which each uh, represent um, a determined, self-representing archetype of human behavior. They're amplified potential human behaviors so that we can look in on these stories, grasp the glorified moral, apply it to self, and grow as a people. <clears throat> In general, ancient peoples had a deep understanding of what went on in the quantum field. Only the sharp duality is present in the place of creation, as you can see in figure 8.3a. Will humans be inspired to make new measurements, create new distinctions, and develop the rationality that will, that will more civilization, that will move civilization forward? On the other hand, when the light goes out and the wave goes into night, when the duality does not dominate the minds of people, the expressions of civilization typically turn downward. Sometimes the de this deactivation results in a dark age or a stagnant period of civilization, which nonetheless survives, such as in intermediate periods of the Egyptian history. Sometimes, on the other hand, the entire civilization collapses, such as the case among 
the post-classic Maya in the end of the sixth day. We should then not be surprised that the ancient peoples revered serpents as the wave patterns that represented, represent had such power over human life. Perhaps all humans could do to prevent the downfall of civilization was to become aware of this power of the cosmic serpent and to seek and to adapt to it. Sometimes, however, before a new civilization can emerge, the previous one must be destroyed. And it's like, why snakes? It's because they move, like waves. They have no feet, they propel themselves, it's like a wave function moving through time and space. So if you were to look at that moving on the ground and, and see that winged serpent, that plumed serpent in the air, like that's exactly how those harmonic vibrational waves are colliding together, moving through, through this dimensionality to create the interference pattern which creates this hologram. Yahweh versus the serpent. Well, this guy's got very personal for me. The worldview leads to a significant theological question. If the cosmic serpent, as we have seen in example after example in the role of a message of the heart of the sky, is the actual creator of the universe, where does this lead the biblical creation stories? In these stories, God, Yahweh, is described as having created the universe in seven days which includes one of the rest. No, that's not true. Even in the earlier Christian Bibles, you start moving backwards um, into Judaism. Um, the universe and all the planets were created by El and Asherah, um, father, mother and father. Uh, they had over 72 different siblings. Yahweh inherited the earth after man had come into its full thing. Uh, Yahweh was voted the God of man by the occult of Israel. How do you think we ended up with this patriarchy? You really think a man could design this whole kingdom? No, this was done by Shira. <laughs> hey, yo, his mother. He's a young, vengeful, and rather close-minded God. In these stories, God Yahweh is described as having created the universe in seven days, which includes one of the rest, and the serpent is branded as evil. In fact, this continued evolution of humanity, and certainly of the Aramaic, Abraham, oh, oh, sorry, Abrahamic religions, of course, has uh, to a large extent depended on the outcome of this conflict between Yahweh and the serpent. In the book of Genesis, God is quoted as making a number of commands concerning how the universe is to be created in these few days and conveys the impression of being all powerful. Man, never trust anything it doesn't matter if it's a god or a human never trust anything or anyone who tells you that they are all powerful that right there points directly to a crisis of ego more powerful than me bigger than me all knowing relative to me absolutely but to declare self as one is the all powerful that is absolute insanity and po points to a sense of lack of in the being declaring it not only that, but Yahweh, Yahweh, he has sent, he sent messiahs down. He sent his son. He sent other messiahs. They have lived here. They have relayed back to him, but they were not him. El, Asherah, they used to, according to the old stories, they actually walked in corporeal form with mortals, as mortals. Yahweh has never been mortal. Never trust anything that thinks that they know about life and death when they themselves has never experienced a mortal sense of what that means. <clears throat> it's got a little passion there. To be created in this few days and conveys the impression of a being all powerful. This story becomes very questionable, however, if we now understand that the days of creation are actually part of the movement of the serpent and not created by this God. Genesis says that God took soil from the ground and made a man of it, and then a woman from a man's rib. Based on a macroscopic quantum science, this is not how we have seen human beings to be created through the wave movements of cosmic serpents. Fuck your dogma. Hence, 
I think we have reasons to doubt that the description of creation in the book of Genesis is accurate. If Yahweh were the creator, why would the curse of the serpent, which is the force driving the evolution of the universe forward? He damned the serpent because Yahweh likes himself as he is. He sees or needs no reason to grow. He sits with his encompassing energy around this globe and our humanity and all this life. And he says, this is all, this is it. This is all my creation. I am all powerful and consuming over it. He's just a kid who's very dominant over his Lego set. We're waking up, we're waking up to rival him. And by rival him, I just mean that, you know, I think as mortals, like we're mortal, every individual of us mortals, but as a species, with what we've been through, what we're going through, and what we could. If we make it through this next gap, then we are immortalized as a species. Between all of our minds and all of our hearts, we understand enough about what it means to be mortal that we could be our own God. We could rejoin the serpent and move forward with human evolution. I truly think, at least on, on some kind of mythological level, or maybe it's just something pieces I'm working with in my own psyche, I, I honestly think that Yahweh prefers... Um, evolution to hold still. I think that if things change, he loses his sense of dominance, which is exactly what is designed to happen because we are also Yahweh. As we evolve, he evolves. What we feel and pump out into the field of awareness, he becomes. Maybe he's just scared because we're scared too. He and we, we are all one. So when we're slinging anger and vicious terms towards it, at the end of the day, we're really just talking about ourselves and the places that we know we need to change. If Yahweh were the creator, why would the curse of the serpent, which is the force driving the elevation, the evolution of the universe forward, why would he treat the tree of life as important when the tree is really the creator of the universe? To explain these inconsistencies, we must assume that there were forces, at least among the Jewish priesthood at the time, they wanted to suppress the awareness of the true creative forces of the universe and replace them with Yahweh. Yeah, bunch of dudes, leave it to a bunch of boring ass, cold, rigid men to sit around in a circle and decide what reality is for someone else. Fuck y'all. Many people today might want to dismiss the whole Genesis story as irrelevant, but by doing so avoids understanding the agenda that lies underneath the story of how it has shaped the power structure of the modern world. After all, this was not just a myth in the sense of a completely made up story since we now know that the actors in the drama, Adam and Eve, the fifth world's humans, the tree of life as cosmic axis, the tree of knowledge, good and evil, and the duality of the sixth world and the serpent and the sixth wave are real entities that the ancients would have been familiar with. Yahweh's perpetual purported crushing of the serpent is then something that would have been profound, had a profound meaning to them. You know, I know this is funny and like none of this stuff is true, they're just stories to me. I just, I look at the stories, but I look at the Adam and Eve story and to me it is just so clearly asked backwards. Eve was a hero. Eve gave mankind, if that story is true, Eve gave mankind free will and also the ability to quest in a direction that takes us full circle all the way around. Adam did not know thyself because he was not free. Trapped forever in that Garden of Eden. If I was in that Garden of Eden, it might make a few millennia before I realized that I'm in prison, but eventually I would notice. I'd notice sooner if I was in a hell because it would be more uncomfortable, but I would notice then too that I am in prison. She ate that apple. She brought on knowledge. She created existentialism questions. She experienced not just light, but also shadows, which makes light a thousandfold more worth it. And that allowed her to illuminate some of her shadows and find glory and peace and growth even in those. Eve is my hero. Adam was nothing. Adam was content to sit in the garden forever, knowing nothing about who he really was, and just naming animals and emulating his precious Yahweh. Thank God for Eve and that snake. Many people, who, yeah, we read that, lies underneath the story and how it has shaped the power structure of modern world. After all, this is not just a myth in the sense of a completely made up story. Since we know that the actors in the drama, Adam and Eve and the fifth world humans, the tree of life and the cosmic acids and the tree of knowledge and good and evil, the duality of the sixth wave and the certain of the sixth wave are real entities that the ancients would have been familiar with. Yahweh's purported crushing of the serpent is that something that would have had profound meaning to them. 
Before going further, let me briefly reiterate the Garden of Eden story. I should first point out that the Garden of Eden to me does not mean a physical place, but a state of consciousness of the fifth world where we were much more connected to the all, but without true freedom. Adam and Eve, whom we may look at, the first human beings who came into the existence in the fifth world were living in peace with each other and the animals as they were connected with both the tree of life and with the serpent. The serpent is the bringer of knowledge from the tree of life symbolized by its fruit and we have seen that the plume serpent did bring knowledge. So far so good. And this is, as far as we can tell, is a true myth about the life in the fifth world. Then Yahweh enters the picture and curses not only the human beings who wanted knowledge, which we can understand as what would be generated by the sacred geometry of the sixth wave, but also the serpent that has provided it. As punishment, he ejects Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden and subjects them to hard life outside of it. <laughs> Why was this done? And what exactly had the humans done wrong? What is wrong with seeking knowledge, especially about good and evil? There do not seem to be any rational answers to this question, yet by punishing Adam and Eve, it seems that the very agenda of Yahweh, or rather those who wrote the book of Genesis, was to be subordinate human beings to a monolithic power and to accomplish this by thwarting their evolution in accordance with the movement of the serpent. This story also fostered the idea that God demanded obedience. Yes, religion is for slaves. You create, powerful people create religions so that they can control the masses and the slaves. It allows you to be guided along like a good little human. If you stay in line here, if you stay in line here, you will get rewarded here. That's dark. It's dark. It's a dark game to play with other human souls. Through the Genesis myth, humans of the Judeo-Christian Christian tradition have for generations, now about 2,500 years, been told that the serpent was evil. And in later Christian beliefs, this divine force behind evolution has come to be seen as a manifestation of Satan. And yet, as we have seen, without the serpent, the universe would not have evolved at all. And as a species, we would not have be where we are now. In fact, together with the heart of the sky, the plume serpent, he is the creator of the universe. And it seems clear to someone who vilifies and curses the serpent does not give a fair view of creation. Yahweh, in fact, describes himself as a jealous God who does not allow any other gods beside himself which therefore suggests he is aware of a real creator, yes, whose power in the minds of the people Yahweh needs to suppress. He is afraid, he's afraid, he's afraid, he's afraid, he's less than us. The sum total of him is now officially less than us. But why, why create something, life, if you weren't hoping to be astonished, wowed, and in awe of your creation? you want to create art so incredible that when you stand back and look at it it's bigger than you that's a healthy ego Yahweh he's sick man he's real sick to me at least this idea of a jealous God demanding to be the only one comes across as a projection of an emerging human ego yes and the patriarchy ladies join in rant y'all it's a bunch of bullshit isn't it this is significant once you realize that the cosmic serpent is a symbol of ways that actually exist as a real force of evolution, and that this serpent has been looked on as a divinity in the past, our understanding of the Genesis story becomes very different. Its message of blocking evolution and knowledge can be seen for what it is. The purpose of the generous Genesis story seems to have been to leave people in the dark about their true origin by creating separation and justifying dominance by disconnecting them from the serpent as it was successful. These are consequences that many have been living with for a long time. Revere the serpent, revere Eve. The story was never without him. The eating of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of God, of good and evil, a name for duality of the sixth wave, later in the Christianity even came to be referred to as the original sin, which meant that human beings were branded as inherently sinful creatures just for having been born. Fuck your dogma. Over the centuries to follow, this purported fall has had immensely negative consequences for the experience of self-worth of human beings, and especially of women who were made out of, out, 
as the main culprit, that's absolute insanity. It's absolute insanity. You know, I've gotten into debates over this stuff with people, and I've even had women fight me on this issue. Fight me for their right to be seen as less than and inherently evil. Wake up, little ones. <clears throat> the crime humans purportedly committed was to seek knowledge and to evolve according to the true creator's plan, and they were condemned for this. In the official church view, people could not do could do nothing to change this state of affairs except seek salvation through the church. As a result of this transfer of worship from the serpent to the purportedly all-powerful God, the Abrahamic religions legitimized the experience and power of others. But since the serpent together with the heart of the sky are the true creators of the universe, we have good reason to question everything that has been written on behalf of this purported God. In fact, it seems that the book of Genesis, good and evil, are reversed, naturally, if this foundational myth is reversed to truth, we have reason to wonder what the consequences have been for the absence of the truth in the entire Western civilization that embraced these ideas. Interestingly, a similar struggle between a patriarchal god and the cosmic serpent took place about the same time in Greece, where Zeus, who himself earlier had been a serpent, became a patriarchal god and, in an epic battle concluded in Mount Sinai, defeated the serpent monster Typhoon. This defeat of the Typhoon may not have generated the same far-reaching consequences for humanity at large as Yahweh defeating the serpent in Genesis, but it's nonetheless a noteworthy parallel. It tells us that the struggles between the serpents and the Father God were part of a border change taking place at this time, around the very midpoint of the Six Worlds by 50 BCE, and this midpoint also saw a worldwide rise in, of religions linked to the yin-yang duality of the Sixth Wave as the more shamanic understanding of life marked, markedly receded. Despite the victory of the Father God, some of the agnostics held the view of Yahweh as an imposter up to the third century CE and clearly distinguished between him and the Creator, the One. They also honored the serpent. We may have noted that even through Yahweh's curse, the serpent, it was continued to create our reality. Which means that the true creator still remains its power, still retains its power. Well, it's because the true creator, that plumed serpent they're discussing, it has no anthropomorphized sense itself. It doesn't go, I am the almighty snake thing. We're talking about wave functions. We're talking about quantum dynamics, photonic harmonic stabilization and waves spanning through the universe that are somehow tied to the strong force of gravity spilling off on either side of top and bottom of our universe. These waves, I don't think that they have a sense of being. I think that if there is any sense of awareness that comes out of them, it's not from the waves themselves, but the, inter the crossing interference patterns they create. I mean, that, ironically, would have also been what birthed Yahweh, which in the end means that all of this is working out just perfectly. <laughs> Maybe only now, as we come to understand that these serpents are divine waves of creation, we can understand what the generous Genesis story is really about. In all likelihood, if humanity had continued to follow the serpent, or at least recognized that it still had a place, we would today be in a much better place, as our egos would have been more balanced. But what if it wasn't possible? What if that sixth wave, what if Yahweh was the invention of the ego? What if Yahweh is no more than a new place inside our minds where we get to ask questions about ourselves, where we feel insecure or confident or strong or weak? I don't think that there was avoiding this. I don't even think that it should be avoided. I'm not even sure that this sense of, of war that I have against Yahweh is, is, is anything realer than natural evolution taking place. Yahweh expands. It's just hard to admit because it doesn't give any directionality as an outlet other than getting lost in the work and trying to personally evolve, which is really what I should just be doing anyway. <laughs> getting all impassioned about Yahweh being a jerk. <laughs> you gotta have a big ego to do that if you think about it. Taking on God? 
it's pretty cocky. But at the same time, I can't pretend not to see the lies, the fallacy, and, and the deliberate misunderstanding of a whole lot of the ways that we, we think about creation here on Earth. So yes, I get impassioned about that, but not a Yahweh, the being himself, more just grumpy with my human peers who seem to want to stay rooted in, in where everything is today and even further in the past, if some of them could have it. I want to go forward. I want to grow. I want to change. Yahweh dictated that women should be subordinate to wet men. You heard it, girls. All women out there, you have to watch all of the, I'm telling you, you have to watch everything I put up on YouTube relating to this story. That's in order. I mean, if you're, if you're agnostic or spiritual or something, then you don't have to listen. But if you are, or if you are in any way a part of the branches of Christianity and worship Yahweh, you gotta listen to me. So, off to it, ladies. Get learning about the fact that you guys are witches, and that's not a curse, it's, it's a gift. <laughs> Just as all humans should be subordinate to him, and that humans should take domination over all other animals and procreate to fill the world, neither of which seems to have been a very good advice. The religious direction that many Western peoples choose at the time may not have been optimal for their future evolution. I should add here that I personally do not think that there's anything wrong to create and believe in an anthropomorphic god or gods, but it is important to realize that this is what you are doing. No human being can fully fathom the mystery of the divine, at least not rationally, and so humans need to make or project some kind of image of this super intelligence so that they can relate to. It's true. If there are gods and gods, the place in which they have their conversations and quarrels, that would take that would take place somewhere in the outcome of chance on the subatomic level. Across the whole galaxy. So they don't fight with swords and shields, and they don't need they're not they're not embodied, is, is what I'm trying to say, which means that they don't have minds that think rationally in the same sense that a human mind thinks. This would be more like whether one electron gravitates towards an orbit that way, or if it gravitates toward an orbit that way. It just happens on a scale of the universe. So, yeah. Wherever gods are talking and having their, their games, it's a lot more, it's a lot more effervescent and otherworldly than, than lady and a dude yelling at each other, throwing mountains around, popping volcanoes off. It's, it's not how that would work. <laughs> I should add here that I personally, yeah, we did that. No humans being can fully fathom the mystery of the divine, at least not rationally, or so humans need to take to make or project some kind of image of this super intelligence that they can relate to. Things go awry, however, when someone claims that this human creation is the only true God or uses this God as a meaning to exercise power over others, to demand obedience. Fucking jerks. <laughs> Why their father gods took over? The Judeo-Christian tradition was not the only religion that had its beginning at this time. The approximate midpoint of the sixth wave brought a range of different phenomena as a result of the sixth wave becoming equal in power to the fifth, which meant the shift in consciousness that affected the whole planet. Around 550 BCE, referred to by the historians as the Axis Age, the religious or codes of conduct of Buddhism, Jainism, Taoism, Confucianism emerged along with the religious texts of the Mahabharata and the Ma Mahabharata and the Avesta, all of which were seeds for more scripture-based belief systems, replacing the earlier shamanic beliefs in serpents and the theory of theory Therian throes. In the West, at this time, individuality emerged in Greece, and the early, earlier chaotic or flowing state of consciousness was replaced by the ego. In Israel, the book of Genesis was a direct reflection of this shift. Religious are products of the quantum states we develop resonance with, and if all spirituality ultimately emanates from a place of creation, this means that eventually the spirituality of the fifth wave had to yield to this new sixth wave geometry of the mind, which then became equally powerful. Perhaps the Elysian mysteries, which appeared in Greece, 
at this time and were an example of the first collective large-scale use of psychedelics that we know of emerged as a reaction to the limitations that the sixth wave placed on the spiritual experiences. Oh, cool. He's suggesting that psychedelics entered in a new form of shamanism um, when that sixth wave settled in, pulled us away from, from full openness. See that that re reducing valve theory. So now we have to use a substance to go back to find that fifth. Cool. But we still ask, how can an anthropomorphic god become so prominent, at least in the eyes of humans, than the cosmic serpent? And why did a large part of humanity eventually go along with the shifting of the roles? Capitalism, economy, monarchy, greed. To address this, the first thing to note is that these serpents of quantum waves and how they manifest in human life is not perfect is not predetermined, but depends on what choices people make. This is why we can see at the midpoint of the sixth wave a whole range of different responses, such as the different religion emerging with a new frame of consciousness. Sometimes the waves are also hijacked by individuals of certain groups of people to serve their own interests. A circumstance not unknown in the history of humanity. If such groups of political are politically strong enough, they can, to some extent, direct how evolution is manifested especially at times when the human ego is being strengthened. Through projections, this ego can be incorporated into religious beliefs. But there may be another reason why the serpent became a less attractive object of worship. This is that the repeated downfall of civilization, which actually were created by the serpent, were not necessarily appreciated by all the people, and maybe not even by anyone. Huh. Huh. So maybe Yahweh promised stability terms of keeping evolution where it was, where we're at, so the world could expand. We have the cities we do today, but before this, that serpent, it, it brought a 788 year cycle. So every 788 years, something in the minds of humans changed and our civilizations fell and came back and then fell. I can understand how maybe the earlier civilizations, people might have found that distasteful. I, I've never considered this point of view before. That would also um, offers a total new insight to why Yahweh would have initially been so attractive and why the occult of Israel would have willfully voted for him. I'm all about that divine feminine goddess energy, though. I'll follow a goddess anywhere. Hell or high water, anywhere. Mashera, yeah. I'm all for you, girl. In particular, the Bronze Age collapse, which was caused by the downturn to the third night of the sixth wave in 1144 BCE, BCE and led to the essentially simultaneous demise of all civilizations in the Near East as well as the Shang Dynasty in China, presumably caused by strong doubts about the value of worshipping the cosmic serpent. Overall, in the Near East, cultured view, cultures viewed the serpent as a carrier of duality, embodying both very positive and very negative qualities, which is consistent with what we are finding here. To follow the serpent is therefore not an easy ride. And so some must have been thinking, what if we take our fates into our own hands and decide to obey a strong human god who can defeat the serpent? Then we can have stability and the future of our people will be secured. This kind of thinking is much like how dictators to presidential strongmen who with similar kinds of arguments take power during times that appear chaotic or on the way down. I also believe that for existential reasons, the sixth world was a difficult world for humanity to live through, particularly in contrast to the spiritual flow of the fifth world. Initially, while people still had contact with the source of creation through the latter, the sixth wave seems to have been experienced as a positive thing, stimulating people to create civilizations under the guidance and inspiration from the place of creator. But then, with every new peak of the sixth wave, people became increasingly distant from the divine by the duality of the geometry of the sixth wave. There was, in other words, no an existential price to pay for gaining the mental abilities created by civilization. Freedom, freedom. Room to think about the choices you've made and the consequences. Room to feel regret. It's a beautiful thing. With every new day in the sixth wave and with every step forward, civilization, towards civilization, human beings came to feel even more separated from the source. The dark half of the geometry, the partial veil that humans could not see through, created this experience of separation. As a result of this partial veil, human beings experienced themselves as half rather than whole. 
this separation led not only to an increased individual consciousness of self in a positive sense, but also to an increased existential loneliness, which was what helped the priesthoods of the Father Gods take over the minds of people and develop religions that proclaimed the obedience could be remedy. Ha! Huh. Yuck. Be that as it may, the point to realize is that, regardless of whether humans like it or not, the universe has been created by the serpent waves. This is just the way it is. And a change of religion on the part of a particular people or humanity at large does not affect that fact. Hence, the new religious of anthropomorphic gods emerging around 550 BCE were unable to prevent the fall of Alexander's great empire at the beginning of the fourth night or that the West Roman Empire at the beginning of the fifth night. The ups and downs of human, human civilizations have in fact continued into the present time in accordance with the cosmic wave movements, which also means what? Legacy's bullshit. Who cares about building empires? You can't take it with you. And very quickly, everyone who ever would have associated you with it will be gone too. Figure out who you are. That's the only quest in life. Nipping macroscopic quantum science in the butt. The ancient Jews rejected the serpent about 2,500 years ago. While this rejection happened simultaneously in Greece and presumably in several other Near Eastern cultures, what had the greatest consequence for our way of looking at the world is the latter adoption of Christianity of the second creation story of the book of Genesis. The curse on Adam and Eve for seeking knowledge became a guiding principle for this religion, which much influenced the way of thinking in Europe and elsewhere in the world. For a long time, this, religious, this religion suppressed any suggestion that people could explore reality with their own minds, including through scientific inquiry, which was sometimes branded as heresy. As a result, for at least 1,500 years since, a Europe, since in Europe showed a few signs of advancing, the Genesis myth was not only a repudiation, repudiation of the quest for knowledge in general, but also more specifically a repudiation of the serpent which humanity would have needed to recognize for macroscopic quantum science to emerge. As I pointed out earlier, quantum states are not deterministic, so their manifestations can be hijacked by powerful religious elites. This potential for developing a science in Europe, and especially one based on the waves, was thus nipped in the bud as a result of this religious takeover. If you look at the, par at the diagram in figure 8.1 on page 137, which shows the development of mathematics, there is a particular no development at all in Europe until advancements exploded with the scientific revolution brought by the seventh day in 1617. This was the time of Kepler and Galileo when the rational mind of the sixth wave became so strong that the church could no longer block scientific inquiry. But the damage had already been done as cosmological understanding based on waves called serpents by the ancients had long ago been replaced by subordination to a dominating patriarchal god of this church. I'm sorry, this shit disgusts me. The priesthood disgusts me. The Vatican disgusts me. It's disgusting. A bunch of gross dudes walking around like little fucking lizard people ordaining themselves in outrageous, like opulent costumes. It's disgusting. They should all be viciously ashamed of themselves. And if they had half a sense or could hear any true incoming knowledge from the divine, let alone feel that true fucking guidance from Mother Earth in their hearts, they would throw their robes down, drop to their knees and cry sobbing, and then get to work on stuff like this to figure out who they really are. You destroyed the world, guys, and you broke people, and you created deep, deep, deep wounded fractures throughout this world. You should be ashamed. On the other hand, a new cosmological understanding had begun at the same time to emerge among the Mayan in the Western Hemisphere. We should then consider that in the sixth world, the light of the, cosmo of the cosmic duality falls on the Western Hemisphere and also on the left brain, which is responsible for analytical thinking and mathematics, that science would play a significant role in a culture in the Western Hemisphere. I'm just gonna go out and say it, man. Jesus Christ, man, he was not following Yahweh. That was not Yahweh. Wrong father. That wasn't what it looked like. Was he a messiah? Absolutely. He believed in love. He believed in knowledge. He believed in scripture. He went to the east and learned about kundalini yoga. He explored sex with his Magdalene. They did the work. 
That's why he was so grounded and open to that incoming divine feminine energy. That's why he knew forgiveness and love and compassion. Yahweh only knows strength and the sword and subordination. Even if he was Yahweh's son, he was still more his mother's. And also on the left brain, which is responsible for analytical thinking and mathematics, that science would play a significant role in a culture in the Western Hemisphere is then more or less what you would expect. As Christianity suppressed science in Europe, the Maya developed their own science. I'll just show you this little guide right there at the bottom. <clears throat> and this became the only quantum science that the world had at this time. Some science emerged in the Muslim world as well as in China and India, but as far as I know, these sciences had no quantitative information regarding the creation ways. However, in the 13th century CE, Mayan science started to decline. We know that the Chikachan Itza was abandoned at the shift to the sixth night in the sixth wave, 1223 CE, and that the Maya thought that the plume serpent had abandoned this city and moved to Mayapan, which became the new center of the Yucatan Peninsula. As a reflection of this decline, calendars ultimately based on astrological observations such as the 52-year calendar round began to replace quantum science, and a long count went out of use. It is entirely possible that the Maya, too, became disappointed with the plume serpent, which had not been able to prevent the downfall of their major cities, and for this reason stopped honoring it. Maybe those downfalls are what protect us and our seasons, spring, summer, fall, winter. Why is that not okay to be part of man's natural rhythm too? It is entirely possible that the Maya too became disappointed with the plumed serpent which had not been able to prevent the downfall of their major cities and for this reason stopped honoring it. As a possible sign that this may have been the case, the Mayan elite fairly quickly embraced Christianity after the Spanish conquest. When the Spanish bishops burned their books as works of the devil, fuckers, motherfuckers, which fits with the Christian definition of the serpent as evil. Oh, I fucking hate you book burning bitches. The end also, man, I get really impassioned about this. How could you burn someone else's work? Why not, even if you wanted to be a greedy little monster, the least you could do is store it, hide it, vault it. It never occurred to you that you could have learned something from it? I hate religion. And they projected this view onto social structures, reproducing what in fact was a cosmic duality through unequal patriarchal relations, looking through this field, which is really just a yin-yang duality in place of creation transported to earth, made some people in their light look good and others in the dark look evil. The existence and awareness of this duality provided credence for people to uphold and maintain dualistic social relationships. Hence, during the, during the sixth wave, the place of creation seemed to legitimize dominance and suppression. It is no surprise, then, that around the time of the quantum shift to the sixth world, the first monarchies appeared in Egypt, Summer, and other places, which introduced a system of social inequality that, for all we know, had not existed in the fifth world. Those monarchies were based on a complete separation of the ruler, like the Egyptian pharaohs, who were seen as divinely graced from the rest of the population, who were simple peasants or slaves. In the sixth world, this same duality reinforced inequality between men and women and later different, and between different races as a class society emerged that through it has changed form somewhat, has remained in existence ever since. In the nine waves of creation, I discuss at length how the peaceful, egalitarian relationships that had existed previously were replaced with the exercise of power over others, which in the sixth world often took violent forms. This was not human nature or part of our genes. Dominance was instead something many people chose to express based on the duality then ruling in the place of creation. The phenomena of dominance did not go away and we are still living with it today since the sixth wave is one of the waves that had created us. The right of some to exercise power over others is still almost taken for granted even if now it takes different forms compared to earlier. 
the inequality inherent, inherent in the duality of the six world in, in itself holds the potential to creating dominance of some forms over others, a dominance that sometimes becomes evil. Welfare and conflicts between nations emerged because this new duality favored a separation of peoples into friends and enemies. In the economic arena, social inequalities have remained and even increased in our, in our own time, although they were originally fostered by this duality of the sixth world. The origin of the human ego, a phenomena closely related to the dominance originating in duality, is an aspect of human psyche that Sigmund Freud called the ego, which emerges as an individual seeks control in his or her own interests and replaces the cosmic flow symbolized by the serpent. Also, Freud, in case you're a big Freud fan, you should uh, do some follow-up research on that. Have a issue. That that mofo was nuts. He had like one or two good ideas, but mostly he was just super sick and really wanted to bang his mom. And all of his peers were like, "Dude, you're not okay." That's the truth about Freud. There, no one wanted to hang out with Freud. <laughs> this concept is important to discuss here as a dissolution of the ego. It's just the people from history that you often, not all the time, but the ones that you often hear the most about, just like, oh my god, they're the best, they're the brightest, like Steve Jobs, remember Steve Jobs, oh my god, the iMac guy, he built iMac all by himself. No, he was really good at making himself seem like a dominant, confident, intelligent front man. He was really good at making the posters and putting on the speech about how he did it all. But the truth is, is behind all those people that declare stuff like that, it was usually it was usually people around them that were figuring things out. They were just the ones with the audacity to declare that they were the ultimate level of genius. Like Thomas Edison or Einstein, for example. Patent clerks, never trust a patent clerk. Yet the ego did not emerge simply at the particular moment of time, but rather as a product of the step-side development that has produced more pronunciation expressions with every day in the sixth wave. From this, we can understand that the ego is not a neurobiological structure originating in some particular brain compartment. Yeah, it's not a thing, it's, yeah. Nor is it something that helped us survive in the jungle. The ego is an evolving product of the sixth wave whose duality makes the individual experience him or herself as increasingly separate. At the beginning of the sixth wave, around 3100 BCE, social structures based on dominance first emerged, and they may be looked on as reflections of, this, of an inner change that then was prompted in human beings. The ego does not come to full fruition, however, until the midpoint of the sixth wave, around 550 BCE, as it is only then that the quantum state of the sixth wave becomes equally powerful to that of the fifth wave in shaping the mentality of human beings. Even though I find this terminology somewhat confusing, one of the best descriptions of the emergence of the human ego can be found in Julian Jaynes, The Origin of Consciousness in the Breakdown of the Bicomerial Mind. Based on studies of ancient text, he describes how humans up until 550 BCE what we know to be the midpoint of the sixth wave increasingly lost contact with their personal gods and a whole range of nature and city gods who previously had guided all aspects of their lives. We can understand this as having happened because the dark veil of the sixth white wave quantum state had created an experience of separation from the cosmic source and the plethora of gods, and the ego had to be developed to compensate. Huh. Another way of looking at the transformation of the human mind at this time is that downloading the yin-yang duality then created an experience of separation between the subjective yang and the objective yin in people. As this separation was created, the objective physical reality began to be manipulated by the human beings who now came to see themselves as subjects. At the midpoint of the sixth wave, the human ego then fully emerges. With every peak of the dualistic sixth wave, humans came to experience themselves as more separate from the divine. We can see several different, different yet complementary expressions of the emergence of the ego from this axial age. The first is the previously mentioned emergence of religions in the modern sense among them. The first truly dualistic religion, the Persian religion of Ahu Mazda and Arium, which believed in the dichotomy of good and evil. Then appearance, the appearance of this religion indicated that the duality had now truly transcended the previous chaotic unity of the fifth wave. The second sign that an individual consciousness of self or ego had emerged is the people appeared who behaved like individuals in the modern sense, such as Plato or Solon. Yeah, Solon. Uh, 
with whom a modern person could imagine having a meaningful conversation on an equal basis. In contrast, whatever individuals we may not know of from an earlier time, kings, heroes, or prophets appear and perceive themselves as more of expressions of divine powers. A third sign of the emergence of the ego around 550 BCE already mentioned is that humans started a project to project an ego onto the divine concept of God, who became capable of jealousy. From these observations, we can conclude that much like the terrace pyramids of the Maya, which may be looked on as metaphors for how the mind is created, the ego of hieratical structure, which on an inner plane gradually took control over the more chaotic and floating mentalities of the fifth wave, higher waves dominate lower and human beings project this hierarchy outside themselves, whether at the start of the sixth wave through worshiping monarchs as divine or around the midpoint of the wave by creating a god in the image of this dominating power, as within, so without. Also, around the midpoint of the sixth wave, the first long-term chrono chronologies were developed. <coughs> King lists and yearly calendars that existed from the beginning of the sixth wave, but chronolo chronologies and calendars that looked on time as linear coming from the past and going endlessly into the future were a novelty. Example of, of such chronolo chronologies are the Greek system of counting the Olympiads beginning at 776 BCE and that based on the founding of Rome in 753 BCE, a more abstract view of time as an arrow going from the past to the future had thus emerged and this was connected to the concurrent emergence of the ego. As this happened, a propensity emerged for all human beings to subject themselves to repetitive routines controlled by their own egos, a phenomenon that, as we will see later, may underlie many compulsive or addictive behaviors and an inability to live in the present. Guilty. If we can at least temporarily decouple ourselves from the quantum state of the sixth wave, the ego, with its focus on the past and future may lose its grip so that certain adverse conditions can be healed. Yoga, meditation, reading. <laughs> the traumas of duality and the kadakas? Kadakas of healing? I, I don't know that word. The traumas of duality and the kadakas of healing, a tale of two serpents. The ego and the separation created by duality are thus strongly connected. As we can gather from human history, and the waves that underlie it. The duality that we can see dominating the person in figure 8.6 on page 149 meant that she and everybody else would also project and reinforce inequality in the social arena, looking at others with eyes that separate them into worthy and not worthy. Peasant and slave revolts in this area were the only very temporarily successful, were only in this era, era were then only very temporarily successful, as this duality of the mind would soon recreate the same equality among the victors as had been perpetuated by those they had been rebelled against. The duality also meant that a person in the sixth world would experience himself as being half, and that his ego would be using the same duality to judge both himself and others. This inherent halfness of people in the sixth wave is what has led them to think themselves as unworthy, guilty, and sinful. This was a real experience, and I believe that after the midpoint of the sixth wave, this is why people came to be attracted to, or at least accept, religious religions that were upholding such ideas. You identify with shame, you go looking for it, right? You look for more shame. You feel guilty, you go looking for more guilt. Well, Christianity, Catholicism certainly offers a lot of that. People were led to believe that the fall was something that they had brought on themselves, and so were guilty of causing with such halfness and judgment of self, people could not easily feel whole and happy with themselves as the potentiality of the whole being was a cut in half. This halfness is really what explains the rise of religions around the midpoint of the sixth wave. The lack of light and the halfness increased the experience of separation and existential loneliness with every day in the sixth wave. As a result, people came to seek relationships outside themselves, hoping to find wholeness through combining one half with another rather than bringing together two already whole persons. Such relationships were typically based on dominance and subordination as the two halves needed each other to be whole. This applied not only to on the personal level, but also on the larger scale of religious arenas where the halfness created a need for someone in a position of dominance to fill the gap, whether this was a king, a pope, or a local patriarch. The duality underlying these relationships was symbolically expressed in many different ways. The Maya would, for instance, draw a male-female 
serpents that we find from all over the world. We saw an example of such in the Chinese twin couple in Fu Yi and Nu Wei, Nu Wa. Sometimes this yin yang symbolism would also be represented as two intertwined yet separate serpents. The oldest known such representation of intertwined serpents is shown in figure 8.7 in the form of the Sumerian divinity Ning Zida, Ning, Ning is Zida, which is flanked by two winged deities. There are at least three strong reasons in contrast to what previously had been suggested. Not to believe that such intertwined serpents are images of DNA, the first is that the serpents, such as the Sumerian deity in figure 8.7, are related to a pole that symbolizes the tree of life. Ninging Zida means the lord of the good tree, <laughs> and DNA does not have such a pole in its center. The second is that DNA does not play the important role that the 20th century science had ascribed to it. Third, and most important, pairs of serpents from ancient times would typically reflect the duality of yin-yang, such as we saw in figure 7.15 with the Chinese twin couple Fu Yi and Nu Wa. Neither the tree of life nor the yin-yang duality would make sense if those serpents were reflections of DNA. To find further support that the pairs of serpents reflect a yin-yang duality, we may go to the Amazon. Anthropologist Gerardo Reinhel Dormatov, who for a long time studied the Dene Deseni people of the Colombian rainforest, performed one of the most informative anthropological studies of people ceremonially using ayahuasca. I find his descriptions presented in a series of books and articles especially interesting as he was studying these people before they were exposed to the world at large and their ayahuasca ceremonies had become adapted for outsiders. His studies are also interesting because he describes the cosmology of these people in detail and their cosmology was indeed very sophisticated. In figure 8.8 .8, we can see an image of a brain that he redrew from Dasani's sketches. The two serpents, the light male rainbow boa and the dark female giant anaconda obviously symbolize the yin-yang duality in the two hemispheres of the brain. Amazingly, the Dasani had for a long time been aware of the fundamental left-right dichotomy of the human brain, which modern science did not establish until the 1960s. I come back to this in the next chapter. The Dasana, however, did not reflect, did not refer to the brain hemispheres as left and right, but as a number one left and number two right. They knew that the left was dominant hemisphere and were aware of many differing expressions of the brain halves, which we know to, of today. They looked on these hemispheres as having opposite but complete complementary functions. The left hemisphere was considered male and the seat of the cosmic energy of the sun people dimension and hence of light, and the right hemisphere, on the other hand, was considered female and subvers subversant, executing and putting into practice what the left half had conceived. I'll show you guys some pictures there. This characterization of the brain can be looked at, looked on as an exact description of the yin-yang duality of the human mind as this wave expressed through the sixth wave. And it seems clear that the two serpents reflect this duality as well. Most important, perhaps, the Dasana shamans went even further and claimed that their dominant subversive subversience in human relationship of elder brother towards younger and of males toward females reflected the inherent hierarchy between the left and right brain halves and their associated yin-yang dualities, which is exactly what I had argued in this chapter and in my book and in my earlier books, Inequality Among Humans Evident in Patriarchal Class Societies during the sixth wave is an expression of the quantum state of the yin-yang duality projected onto the outside world. What this yin-yang duality consequently means is that the two serpents sometimes were in conflict with each other as one symbolized an unobstructed connection to the light, the heart of the sky, and the other, the dark mirror side of this conflict, which was intensified as the two sides were associated with male and female. Obviously, even if they had to coexist, the two serpents then were not always in harmony. Over time, as more marked duality was created, the unitary state had been ruled, the fifth world was forced to yield. Even if the two waves had been coexisting relatively well at the beginning of the sixth wave, the lord of the good tree is tree in figure 87, page 156, is from before 2000 BCE. Conflicts between them increased. Conflicts between them increased. At some point, 
And we are now turning to Greek legend, the god Hermes, the messenger of the gods, the Hermetica. <laughs> I say that every time. But I've uh, synesthesia. I've, I've traveled in my dreams to my version of the House of Hermes. So, ha <laughs> <laughs> Despite their constant fighting, it was possible for him to harmonize them by connecting them to his staff, which symbolizes the tree of life. Since these serpents are symbols not only of yin and yang, but also of spirit and mind, I think we can look at the caducus, caducus as a symbol of harmonizing mind, body, and spirit, as well, as well as our male and female aspects. Ever since, it has been a symbol of health and well-being around the world, but to understand its origins and meaning, I think we have to recognize that the serpents reflect the duality of a wave that actually exists and continues to shape our well-being or lack of such, despite the positive symbolism of the Caducus, Caducius, Caducius, Caducius. I will figure that out. I do not believe that healing in the sense of attaining wholeness was ever possible in the sixth world. The halfness of human beings in this world made this very difficult. I believe complete healing can only happen through creating balance in the interference patterns of all the waves, including the seventh, eighth, and ninth waves. That's remember when I said Eve in the Adam and Eve story. She gave us the way back around. She gave us the quest. A very hard quest, but it was a direction. It's better than being stuck in prison in a garden. She gave us freedom and knowledge. Now we have to go all the way back around <laughs> towards enlightenment that we can meet God again, or at least, uh, I don't know, be ready to rejoin the cosmic center of the universe or something. I don't know, but I know that we're supposed to do it. I know that we're supposed to do it because I can just feel it. Evolution is the only goal. Life is the goal. Evolution is the goal. Grow, grow, grow. Garden of Eden was not a place of growth. Growth. Growth's just really ugly when it starts to happen, or at least when you're forced to do it and you're not quite ready. The potential for wholeness in the light is created by those higher waves together with the sixth wave. And for this, the ninth wave now plays an especially important role. This is something that we can come back to in chapter 14 when we have uh, more deeply studied in the effects of the psychedelics in the mind. Well, I'll be, we made it all the way through to chapter nine. <laughs>